Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, the 529 College Savings Plan, part five in our series on college funding with financial advisor John McDonough of the College Funding Institute. Welcome to the fifth segment, John. Thanks, Steve. John, we're talking about this whole issue of need, what qualifies for need, what's the percentage of need. Walk me through the basic concept of how can I think, if I'm watching this show, how do I quantify what is the percentage of my need for my child? Wouldn't it be great to think that if your expected family contribution, what the government says you should be able to afford to pay for college, if it's less than the cost of attendance, then whatever's left over, the school's just going to automatically pick up and pay for? Yes. No, um, but unfortunately yeah. they don't do that, oh, okay. right? So that's what this percentage mm -hmm. of need met concept is. Every school every year has a different percentage of need that they meet. Some are very generous with their mm -hmm. percentage of need met. The Ivy League schools, the Dukes, the Chapel Hills, the, the you know, those caliber of schools are mm -hmm. very good. Whatever the number is, whether it's $5,000 or 50 something thousand dollars, historically speaking, they will meet 100% of the need. But then you have these other schools where they only meet 60% or 50%. And then a portion of that, the majority of it comes in the form of loans. Wouldn't a parent like to know before their child submits the application if, in fact, that school meets a high percentage of need and then what percentage of that comes in the form of free money as opposed to loans? Wouldn't that be helpful? I'm waiting for you to come out now, John, with your top 10 colleges that fit that profile. We keep a list. Every year the list changes. We don't have a top 10 list. We have a top 150 list wow. of schools. And there are schools that can put them on. You, you drop some big names there, and you're saying that they're picking up 100% of this. Well, yeah. It doesn't matter to them. They have a image to upkeep and maintain. Mm -hmm. And so if the student is qualified to get accepted, irrespective of their financial picture, they will do everything in their power after some appealing and negotiating, not all up front, but that school will be very, very generous with meeting that need. Wow, I love that. Now, when you're looking at 150 schools and you drop some names here, there are going to be some players here that if, there, if all things being equal, that's where I need to look. Well, and isn't that what we want for our kids? To get a degree from a very prestigious school mm -hmm. that gives them the opportunity to get a really good interview and a really good job so they can make a lot of money and take care of us in our old age? I, I'm all over giving the best education as a parent, and I think that's the way to go. 529s. Now, I've been in this business 35 years, and when 529s, we thought it was going to be the silver bullet. And it turned out to be just another plan. The they were stuff. supposed to be better than zippers and sliced bread. Right. And I thought, hey, you know, mutual funds and ETFs and yeah. call it a day. Yeah. Talk to me about, are they really a player in this any longer? Are they still? Should we still look at them? And is the only game in town mutual funds and ETFs? Well, 529 plans are not all they're cracked up to be. In fact, 529 plans is just one vehicle for the overall strategy mm -hmm. Of saving for college. Now, are they good? They're mm -hmm. good if you started saving 17 years ago. They can be a very good holding tank of mm -hmm. money to help pay for college. But if your child's in a senior in high school or a junior in high school, even late stage freshman in high school, you don't quite have the time mm -hmm. to expose the money to the variable nature of the stock market because you can't afford to lose well, the money that you're saving for well, retirement well, John, or for college. You, you just hit the big variable here, yeah. the, the market. Now, I remember in 2008 when everybody was getting their, when they had their 401k handed to them, yeah. by the, you know, 30, 40 percent losses. You mean their 201k. Their 201k. And by the way, think about this. Uh, we didn't really break par until somewhere around 2016. And just about the time we broke par, right, we had a little kind of a comeback. Da, da yeah. comeback. So the, the reason I bring this up is because every time I've brought up 529s and I say, unless you have a different way to fund this, ETFs and mutual funds, I'm exposing my hard-earned money after tax most of the time into the market. And I have to say, after 2008, not only did my 401k take a bath, but people that were in 529s, I said, I just lost 30 to 40 percent of my kids' educational fund. How do I? This is why I'm, I'm bothered by this. There's got to be a safer way to save than a 529. There's much safer places to save than in a 529 plan. Here's the problem with most 529 plans. They were set up by your financial advisor or a stockbroker or a sister or brother-in-law that may not even be a sister or brother-in-law mm -hmm. anymore. 
but it was set up just randomly. Let's pick a monthly amount and start saving it without any expectation of what the future cost of education was going to be. Mm -hmm. That's like asking you to save for retirement with just some random number as opposed to putting a calculation to it, right? Mm -hmm. And then to put salt in the wound, the commissions were high, the expenses were heavy, and the performance was horrible in these 529 plans, and it just completely underwhelmed and underperformed what the expectations well, were. Well, now let's just make sure we got that on the same page here. The 529 plan is just a vehicle, but everything you just said that costs us money was in the market. Yeah. So if I have high expense mutual funds and, and uh, ETFs, the expense loads are there. Okay. Performance is a question, especially in 2008. I mean, I'm thinking of people that it went through the three market, back to back to back, 2001, two, and three. Yeah. Back in the day, I mean, our kids were in school, right? And we're taking losses every year, and they're double-digit compounded yeah. losses. This is why people somehow, they say, that, John, there's got to be a better way than 529 plans just because it's so limited in what I can put in it. Our families cannot afford to take distributions from their 529 plans or just call it even stock market investments and multiply that or couple that with negative performance mm -hmm. in the stock market at the same time. No, That's the fastest way to run out of money. So how do I do that? Is that defendable? It is. Well, it depends on the student. It depends on the family. It depends on the situation. It depends on the cost of attendance of the school, right? Mm -hmm. It's all of those variables, which is why you can't talk to your neighbors about it because they might have a different financial picture and different school costs mm -hmm. than what you've got. But what we've got to look at is, yes, there are other vehicles, safer money vehicles that can come into play. It could be in the form of really cash is an option. Paying cash is an option for school and not having the money invested. But it can go all the way through to insurance types of products as mm -hmm. well that could be good uses of funding mechanisms for college. Well, give me an example of an insurance product that you would like to see as an alternative. Because some people will say, Steve, I'm, I'm at day one here. My kid just... My child was just born. I got 17 years the horizon. I think I can live with the ups and downs of the market. So yeah. I, I'm okay with 529s. Yeah. When we deal with our families, almost all of our families are late stage seniors, late stage juniors, late stage sophomores, late stage freshmen. Everybody's late, by the way, because they've had 17 years to start properly planning for this. And nobody's doing it. And nobody's doing it or they're not doing it at a proper level. So everyone's mm -hmm. late and behind schedule. When we deal with our seniors, juniors, sophomore families, and we have enough cash flow enough assets, and a proper expectation of what school costs and what school's going to pay for, you can use a very well-structured life insurance vehicle. And it can be whole life. It can be universal life. It can be IUL. We're agnostic to which one of those it mm -hmm. needs to be. We just want to make sure that the money is there when the clients need it to be there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me, since it just happens to be the most popular uh, chassis that's out there for mortality, uh, I'm looking at an index universal life. Some people actually fund their 529s with index funds, mm -hmm. where it's in the S&P 500, one yeah. of the typical cho choices. So, But the thing that I think I've understood on the IUL or the index universal is that I still have expenses in my policy, but I can never go below zero being credited into my account. Did I get that right? Correct. It, 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 nothing's perfect, and everything has pluses and minuses. An IUL, when properly structured, is not too good to be true. It's too good to be free. Mm -hmm. And what we're eliminating is the negative sequence of returns risk. We're eliminating the, the timing of risk of returns mm -hmm. when you have to take money. Imagine this. Most, most times when we deal with our families, we're showing them taking $30,000, $40,000, $80,000 mm -hmm. distributions to pay for not just one child in school, but maybe two in mm -hmm. school at the same time. With the IUL product or the Index Universal Life product, we are eliminating the possibility of a negative stock market happening while you're mm -hmm. taking those distributions. So that could be a suitable product as an could alternative or product. added on to a 529. Mm -hmm. So they're not in competition with each other. They're, they're just, they could be. They're supplemental of one another. Okay. Yeah. Now, when, in your experience, in your experience, how many people are still doing 529s maybe versus and index universal life. What's the, the play there from a savings point of view? From a savings point of view, when someone comes and talks to us, most people have some type of a 529, either a savings plan or a prepaid mm -hmm. tuition plan. Most people have something. Very few people have nothing, right? Even if they have $1,500 or mm -hmm. a small amount in it, hardly anybody has been properly educated as to the benefits and the features of a properly structured index universal life product. Okay, so that could be a major play 
as an addendum or actually augmenting your 529. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've talked about so many things here today, and, and let me tell you, I, I think we're going to get some serious traction on this because we're speaking to the number one fear in America. How am I going to fund? You know the game. You, This is all you do. This is all I do. There are very few financial advisors. Are ex their expertise is in college funding. I know. Wow, John. I want to thank John for being on our show today and sharing this series on college funding. And keep in mind, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, and of course, your financial advisor. And in this case, for college planning, it's John. And you've been watching Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game. <laughs>